So my name's Jenny Keithley. I'm just coming to the end of a three-year project working just on fairy rings uh, on the cause and control of. And it's a project run by STRI and Harper Adams University, which is a small agricultural union in Shropshire, and it's fully funded by the RNA, so they've kindly sponsored the whole project. So, firstly to give you an introduction to the fungal kingdom, so just like animals and plants, there's now a fungal kingdom, whereas they were once classified with plants. Um, we've now found out they're more closely related to us than they are to plants, because humans, well, animals and fungi both hunt for food, whereas plants make their own food. So very, very distinguished difference there. So the fungal kingdom is huge. They estimate there's about over a million species of fungi in the world. Of those, we've only really discovered about 10% so far. Um, so the group is about, it's going to be about six times more diverse than flowering plants. So uh, we're looking at a lot of different fungal species. Um, so we can roughly split this big kingdom fungi into two groups. Uh, we've got the ascomycetes, now they're known as the spore shooters. So they've got various ingenious methods of shooting their spores out into the environment in order to reproduce. If for greenkeepers that includes diseases such as Fusarium, Take All, Dollar Spot are all ascomycetes. The group that we're looking at today is Basidiomycetes. Now these are known as the spore droppers. So this is anything that drops its spores from gills or pores, which is basically all the mushrooms. So anything, any mushroom that you see will be a type of Basidiomycete. Of these Basidiomycetes, of which there's an awful lot, uh, we know so far there's at least 100 different species that grow in ring formation. So the spore or piece of mycelium will, will start off at one point and it's foraging outwards, feeding on organic matter into the soil at a roughly even rate so that we get this ring shape. Um, generally the bigger the ring, the older the individual is. So there are some cases of huge, huge fairy rings of which you can only see a partial side of it that they reckon could be a thousand or more years old. So uh, fungi can be some of the largest and oldest organisms in the world. So of these hundred or so uh, ring forming basidiomycetes, we've got various ones that just grow in woodlands, various ones that just grow in agricultural lands. On turf, specifically sports turf, I think most of the time we're probably dealing with the same roughly 10 different species. So if we get to grips with the ones that are most commonly causing fairy ring, uh, I think that's a big step forward. But those few species are very different and they can cause very different effects, just like uh, a badger and a rat, say, have got different responses to different chemicals and different physiology and chemistry. So are different species of fungi. So I'll just start introducing you to these differences by, if you want to pass these plates around, the three different species that we're going to be looking today and just see how different they are. The colorations, how fine the mycelium is, sorry they've steamed up a bit on top so you can't see them that well, but certainly from underneath you start getting an idea of how different they are. So that's what's growing under your fairy ring in the soil basically, probably one of those species. Um, so I'll just run over the normal, the classification system that we've used for fairy rings for over 100 years now is still stuck. It's what most of you will probably be familiar with, which is the type 1, 2 and 3. Have, have many of you come across those before? Different types or grades of fairy ring. Okay. Um, I'll run through them now. And in fact, they're just on there as well. If you want to just pass that round just to recap people with the different symptoms that I'm going to talk about. Um, so your type 3 fairy ring is just mushrooms or puffballs, so you're not really going to get any effect on the turf, it's just going to be a circle or partial circle of uh, fruiting bodies. So unlikely to be a problem for you on sports turf, if you don't want them there you either mow them or pick them off. Um, type 2 is the most common form of fairy ring that we get in this country and it's actually, you might be able to see one just here if you want to have a look. It's, uh, it's coming in around here and then it crosses back over there. So that is a type 2 fairy ring and it's where the grass is stimulated. So the action of the fungus feeding in the soil is releasing nutrients which the grass is then taking up and that's uh, giving us this real dark sort of lush growth of the grass. So that's called type 2 symptoms. 
Type 1 symptoms are the real nasty ones. That's when you lose turf. So it's possible for type 2 to transgress into type 1 if it becomes sufficiently dry because the loss of turf is mainly related to low soil moisture. Now, if you've got type 1 fairy rings and you've lost turf on your fairy rings 9 times out of 10, it's going to be caused by this little guy here. And this is what you've just been eating, this is what's in your soup. It's a real delicacy in France and we don't seem to use it much here, but this is called Marasmus. So it's a small brown mushroom, obviously these are dried samples so they don't display quite as well as the fresh wood. Um, but we're looking for the cap and the stem being the same colour. That's about as big as they get. Uh, really, really common. They're probably only going to be on your fairways. It's quite un unlikely that you'll get these on greens. They grow very deep. They can be up to 50 centimetres down in the soil. They'll usually be very thick, chunky rings, whereas some of the others are a bit finer that we're going to look at. Now, the reason why type 1 fairy rings lose turf, it's really down to two main reasons. Firstly, uh, the surface of the mycelium of, of that particular fungi, thank you, of that particular fungus and some of the others contain surface proteins called hydrophobins and that's what repels water. So as the mycelium of that fungus is getting thicker in the soil, the soil is going to get more and more repellent to water. So obviously then the plant's going to suffer from drought stress because there's just no water getting through. So the water is not going to be soaking in your plants drought stressed. On top of that, this species in particular, Marasmus, which most commonly causes type 1, also emits cyanide into the soil. So you've got an accumulation of toxins, mostly cyanide, in the root zone. Um, it also inhibits some of the good bacteria in the soil that convert ammonium to the plant's available form. So you get an accumulation of ammonium in the soil that the plant can't use and is actually toxic to it. So these two aspects, which are exacerbated by hot, dry weather and when the soil's dry, um, kill the turf off. So what we're aiming to do with type 1 fairy rings is really nip it in the bud and get them treated before they start becoming, before they start repelling water, before they become hydrophobic, we call it. So what we're going to look at is how to recognise when your root zone is becoming hydrophobic. Does anyone use the water drop penetration time test to look at their dry spot or to monitor any fairy rings? No. Right. Will someone kindly take me a soil core from that there ring, please? Any volunteers? Don't make me do it myself, yeah. please. Thank you. It's pretty solid at this side, actually. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it'll be all right. Anywhere? Anywhere, yeah. Usually on a fairy ring, most of the mycelium is in the very outside of the edge because it starts to die off in the middle so the most vigorous is usually right at the edge of the symptoms you don't need to go too deep because it's only really the top no. bit we're going to be looking at so that looks fine thank you oh, um, thank so much. that's great cheers Fair enough. Fair. Right. thank you so if you've got type fair type one fairy rings or even type two fairy rings that have got a chance of turning into type one you need to be starting to use methods like this to monitor them. Um, firstly, you're going to need to be using a soil moisture probe. Does anyone use the Field Scout or a Theta, theta probe usually? Theta. Yeah, yeah they're, they're both just as good. Uh, I use this because it's a bit more robust, because obviously fairing soils become so dry, those Theta probes bend. I keep yeah. getting told off for breaking them. So. <laughs> um, so you need to be measuring soil moisture of your fairy rings. Now, even though the symptom looks the same all the, all the way around the fairy ring, that active zone can be really variable. So what I would say is take several measurements around the outside to get a good idea of exactly how dry it is. Because you can get a measurement of 28% water content in one place and then two next door. It really is that variable. So if you're going up to your fairy ring saying, oh, it's on 20, it's fine. That's not necessarily the case. Check it again and again and again just to make sure at different points around the ring and then if you do start as it gets to, towards summer maybe and it does start getting drier and you're noticing lower soil moisture results you need to really be starting to do this which is looking for hydrophobicity which is so straightforward it's really easy for you to do what we're looking for is what simply whether a bead of water soaks straight in or not so this ring 
I'm just going to go about here because hydrophobicity is usually within the top five centimetres of the soil. So monitor the top is easiest and if you can see that's soaking straight in straight away. That's immediate so there's no hydrophobicity there. If that was beading like we see on these, in fact you want to pass one of those around. Thank you. Um, if we get this sort of beading that's in indicative of a hydrophobic soil. Especially if it's taking more than five seconds to fully soak in, you're looking at severe severity, that severe hydrophobicity there, um, and that's when you really need to be taking action. If you start getting this hydrophobicity, you've got to really focus on water management. You've got to break that ring up with aeration as deep as you can. You've got to get wetter in there, um, sorry, wetting agent in there, and you've just got to irrigate and keep it thoroughly wet. Don't let that ring dry out because those symptoms are going to get worse and worse and worse. So. It's basically about vigilance and monitoring and making sure that that hydrophobicity isn't developing. If it is and you don't get on top of it through aeration and wetting, you're going to get a problem because eventually type 1 rings can be set in all year round, they can lose turf all year round and they can look a right mess. So if it does get to that stage, you're not going to get anything in there really to be able to tackle it. So the, the longer you let it go on, the worse it's going to get. You really need to nip it in the bud with tight one fairy rings. Thank you. If it gets to a stage where you've got a really set in ring and you're not able to re-wet it, which does happen, um, you're really going to be look at, looking at digging it out. So obviously this species is deep growing up to about 50 centimetres, so you're going to be needing to dig at least two foot in. You've got to remove everything that's in there. If you leave a little bit behind, it's just going to sprout a new ring. So you'd need to be digging beyond the ring. Um, I would suggest maybe about a metre around the outside of the ring. So obviously it's one hell of a job that you really don't want to be doing. So um, you just keep on top of it to try and get it before it gets to that stage. If you do have to dig out, there's another option that I'd like to speak to you about, and it's, it's to do with fungal antagonism. Does anyone know of any concepts of using fungi to fight each other or they're all over the place really in horticulture industries and the forestry industry but in this case there's been a lot of work done on this one on Merasmus getting it to fight itself basically. It's known to release um, some kind of inhibitory metabolites, we don't really know exactly what yet, um, that stop itself from growing if it comes in sort of face-to-face -face contact. So it's the sort of thing I've been working with in the labs and this is what I've been doing on Petri dishes. So it's basically putting two Merasmus mushrooms against each other. And you see we get this standoff. Now in some cases uh, in the wild on the golf course, they'll wipe each other out. And this is quite a known concept. There was actually a chap here um, years and years ago called Drew Smith. And he did a lot of work on fungal antagonism with this mushroom, with Merasmus. And what he did is he'd, he'd rotivate the whole area, really mix up the soil at the affected area and re-turf it and he found years later there'd still be no Merasmus rings. Now I know this is a really disruptive process, so I've spoken to a couple of greenkeepers that have tried this that have been badly affected by fairy rings and they've reported the same that years on they've still not had any problems. Um, obviously that's worst case scenario that you would ever really rip it up and start from scratch like that but what I think it's worth looking at is playing around with maybe swapping soil cores ring to ring and seeing if you can get them to extinguish themselves. It's just something so easy that you could do if you've got fairy rings on your cores. Just use a plug cutter to swap the cores from each ring and you're essentially introducing an enemy into the circle and it will start battling itself. It might work, it might not. You know, sometimes we see rings merging together, sometimes they'll battle and they'll extinguish each other or sometimes they'll just reach a standstill and you get an inhibitory zone between the two like you see here. So I just think it's something worth knowing about is antagonism in case you want to try it as a simple method in the field. And certainly if anyone does have any luck using methods like that, we'd love to know about it at STRI, uh, just in case it is something that we, we need to really be pursuing more seriously. Um, so it's not just Merasmus that does this. I've been playing around with another few species. This one is another that we're going to look at today, which is Agaricus, which is the field mushroom. And as you can see there, it appears to do a very similar thing. So it might work with different species of fairy ring. So it's, it's something worth trying.
So I'm just going to look a little bit at type 2 fairy rings, which say that they're actually more common and they're going to be more of a problem on greens to you. Type 1s are unlikely to occur on your greens, whereas type 2s are. Um, this is the field mushroom. You might have noticed it about loads this year. It's been a really good year for mushrooms with having a dry summer followed by a couple of weeks of real high rain. Um, so this is big white mushroom, similar to the one you buy in the shops. Um, send those around if you like. Have a little sniff because <laughs> they're very strong. Um, so they're, they're not going to be here for long, Aragaricus rings. They've been all over the place, but only from about July to September. So there's not been an awful lot of work done on them, even though they're prolific and you get them everywhere on a good year. But I think because they're quite fleeting and they're sort of gone before you know it, no one's really concentrated any work on them. I've got some trials running at the moment, so hopefully in a few weeks or a few months' time we might have some results available on control of agaricus rings. Um, so you, your main option with agaricus rings is just to hide them if they're a problem, so you're looking at putting iron or nitrogen on basically to disguise the symptoms. Um, so the last one that I want to talk about is that most of your type 2s are probably going to be caused by one or another puffball species. There's quite a few puffballs. Um, this is probably, well, one of the most common. It's called Bavista. And again, if you want to pass those around, thank you. I'm sorry there's not more of those. I had some fresh ones, but they began to smell, so I had to chuck them away. Um, but they're a really round, smooth puffball, those ones. Some of the other puffball species you get are quite irregular and they've got a bit of a warty appearance. Um, Bavista will start to have this cracking pattern on the top if you can see that and if you pick one when it's fresh and it's getting mature you'll be able to just flake bits off and underneath will be a bit of a grey skin because its common name is the grey puffball and then once that matures the skin will rupture and it will release spores so that's a really common culprit of type 2 rings and you'll probably notice that they're very fine rings they, they don't tend to look like these marasmus rings if you look at your hand out you might notice that you know, some of them are slightly different. Um, certainly things like this, where you've got this, this sort of watermarked effect will often be caused by puffballs. Uh, now the good thing about puffballs is that they're quite shallow foraging, so they're in the upper layers of the soil. They're not like marasmus where they bury right deep down, um, which means you can tend to get into them with fungicides a bit easier. And they have been known to respond quite well to early applications of preventative fungicides. So we're looking propiconazole uh, and or azoxystrobin as soon as symptoms start to appear in the early spring try preventative fungicides. Some of my colleagues have said that they actually apply the previous autumn ready for the coming season and have found pretty good results with that as well. Um, but obviously you'd, you'd do your fungicide applications alongside the same sort of aeration and wetting techniques as you would use with agaricus because say water management is also really important. Um, so the good news is you've got a chance with chemicals with these if you need to. But say a lot of people say they're not a huge problem. Again, they're not going to be persistent all year round. They're probably going to come and go. Um, worst case scenario, they'll be there spring through to autumn and you've still got the option of disguising them if need be with iron or nitrogen. Um, this is a bit of work that I did last year on Marasmus rings and this graph's the main thing really. It's the difference between fairy ring soil moisture and an asymptomatic, asymptomatic area that's just next door to it. And as you can see, uh, last year we had a really dry spring, didn't we? So even earlier on in the year, we've got this massive moisture deficit so I think what that shows us is that to be vigilant all year round, it's not just a summer condition. And by the time it gets to summer and you've started thinking, oh, best check on the fairy rings, it might be too late. You might already have hydrophobicity developed. So just check them early on in the season as well. Just to say, nip them in the bud and make sure you're catching it and getting it really wet before you start getting hydrophobicity.